Our speaker this evening was formerly from Vertica Systems until he became the founding engineer of Vault DB. Please welcome John Hug. Thank you. Uh, so I didn't write the trivia questions. Uh, I didn't presume anybody, anybody knows who I am. Uh, but just some background, I'm the founding engineer at Vault DB. I was at Vertica, as you said. Uh, I've made a lot of bad decisions building a lot of the systems I've built over the years, and I'm a big believer that that's how you learn how to build things. Uh, so hopefully now I kind of know a little bit about what I'm talking about, and I can share some useful stuff here. Um, oops. Uh, if you want to contact me after the talk, I'll put this on the last slide too, but jhug at volttv.com. That's my Twitter. And then we have a, a Slack at Volt that uh, anybody can join to chat about Volt or the weather or uh, Bedford, Massachusetts. Um, I'm going to talk tonight about uh, operations at scale, uh, about sort of uh, the intersection of stream processing and transaction processing. Uh, I'm not going to do a big what is VoltDB, how is it built, how is it architected, uh, why is it different than other systems. I've got talks like that, but um, sort of we've been around for long enough that I don't tend to give them. I try to give a little bit more interesting talk about the kinds of apps that we can build with the software. Um, and it's not, I'm not going to cover every kind of app that you could build with VoltDB. We've got all kinds of different uses in, in telecommunications, ad tech, um, finance, all, I mean, online gaming is a big one for us. Uh, but just sort of a subset that might be interesting. Uh, but uh, I don't have to go after the talk. I'm here for a while, so if people have questions, uh, I'm happy to answer whatever questions you guys have, either live tonight or, or later. Uh, so what are we talking about when we're talking about operations at scale? Uh, so in this case, we're talking about ingesting data from lots of different sources into a uh, horizontally scalable system. We're talking about processing that data when it arrives, so that could be translating, uh, transforming, correlating, filtering, aggregating, uh, somehow sort of cleaning up the data. Uh, and when we get that data, right away we want to understand what it means, we want to act on it, we want to take action, and we want to record what we did. What the data was, what our response to it was, we want to know that information live, not hours later. Uh, and then, getting to the hours later part, we want to push the relevant data to a downstream big data system. Uh, so you can do those kind of deep learning, awesome uh, analytics that you do on, on the big data systems. So one of the really common things people do when they have operational problems like this is they go to like Apache.org, they take a look at the menu they have there, um, they pick a bunch of software and they start gluing it together. And so one example of the kind of thing you might get after visiting the Apache menu, um, this is uh, something that was in production. I think now they're using Heron instead of uh, Storm, but um, it, this is kind of a common thing that ends up when you go to the Apache menu and you start sticking things together. So I've got Zookeeper for, for coordination, for agreement, I've got Kafka for ingestion, I've got Storm for processing, and I've got Cassandra for state. There's about a million different ways you could end up with something different. Maybe I have Redis instead of Cassandra. Maybe instead of Kafka, I've got RabbitMQ. Maybe instead of Storm, I've got Heron or, or Spark Streaming or Flink or 10 other different technologies. Uh, instead of Zookeeper, I could have etcd or console, these kind of things. But, but generally, I'm gluing together a whole bunch of things to build a system. And I, I think of this kind of architecture as sort of a Rorschach test. Uh, if you see this, like people have really different reactions to it. Sometimes they see this architecture and they go, that's awesome. I want to go work there. Um, if that's you, then my talk is for you. And sometimes they see that and they go, oh no, maybe I've walked into the wrong job interview. Um, and my talk is also for those people. Uh, but, but, so, say you go to any tech conference, and maybe you're at some, this is from Strata last year, and you're 16 talks wide. Um, there's almost always going to be a talk, you know, here's one by me, but there's always going to be a talk where it's sort of building this with blank, 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 and blank. And then, you know, if you're lucky, there'll be five blanks or six. And you'll go to this talk, and what you'll see is someone on stage and she'll tell you, we use these nine tools, and here's how we glued them all together, and we built this thing, and it almost works. Uh, it sort of works. We're, we're very excited about it. Um, and here's the sort of Herculean things we've done in order to make it productive. Uh, these talks can be really interesting, but they often leave me sort of smashing my head. I want to, you know, say, really, like, there's got to be a simpler way. Um, and kind of come back to that in a second. And, and 
as background at, at Volt DB, when we were founded on the idea, this is a big idea uh, of Dr. Stonebreaker, but also a lot of other people, the idea that, that we're not gonna build one data system that's gonna solve every problem in data management. Every application is gonna have one, one solution. Uh, so, so one thing is, I, I used to work at Vertica before I worked at Volt, and we had um, you know, analytics systems and operational stateful stores uh, work better with their different systems. Right? Vertica is a column store, and it's optimized for mostly immutable data, and it can do a lot of things that Volt can. Volt is a row store that leverages in memory and, and uh, is specially designed for lots and lots of short transactions. It can do a lot of things Vertica can. These are two different systems. Similarly, uh, systems that are really good at machine learning um, may not look like Volt or Vertica. Systems that are good at multi-dimensional math. Uh, one of the other uh, Stonebreaker companies um, Paradigm 4 does, does really cool science databases that use arrays and things. Uh, graph systems, search systems, full text search, these are things that, that end up looking different than these kind of systems. Um, there may be different systems even based on whether your data is valuable or not. Right? If you have just sort of one-off data and you're collecting tons of it and it's not all that valuable, you may want to use a different system than if you're collecting credit card information. Uh, so we're big proponents of one size doesn't fit all. Um, and of course there's blockchain, which is everywhere. And I don't know, if you want to do four transactions a second, it's the system for you. Uh, but where, what, what we're coming back to before, where integration makes sense is when we're looking at leading edge operations. That is, an event happens and I need to react to it. Um, so operational screen processing, operational state, uh, looks a lot like OLTP, these things are sort of blurring together. Uh, this is the place where I'm going to argue that you don't want to have nine systems. You can't always get away with one. Even with Volt DB, a lot of our customers have more than one, but you want as few as possible. So why is operational streaming, operational uh, systems like OLTP and stream processing, do you want as few as systems as possible? Uh, well, when you have more than one system, you have to write glue code that's, that glues these systems together, or you have to use someone else's glue code that glues these systems together. Um, operational glue code is often a lot trickier to get right than, than batch processing glue code or offline glue code. And one of the, the big reasons that is, is because you've got a huge safety net for these batch OL, uh, OLAP glue code. For these batch processing systems where you're writing a job to process things, um, you've got things like HDFS and CSV. And the number one thing about HDFS and CSV is that you have immutable data sets. So you write some processing code that takes a data set in HDFS, it turns it into some other data set in HDFS. If you did a bad job, you just do it again better. You're already you know, dealing with latency in the minutes or possibly hours. Uh, so if you have to do something twice, it's usually not the end of the world. Uh, and because you can't screw up the original source data, it means two people can be doing the same processing at the same time. There's a lot of benefits to having systems like HDFS and CSV. Um, and, and the problem is HDFS allows you to do these things in batch, um, but HDFS is really bad at operations. It's not something that's designed for I need to do something in milliseconds. It's designed for I need to do something in minutes or hours. Uh, there are you know, systems like HBase that sort of sit on top of HDFS that have some oper that are in some ways really, really good for operations, but it's really uh, sort of twisted how they get there. They don't directly use HDFS the way, you know, with all the benefits of HDMS, like HDFS, like sort of the immutable data sets. So coming back to the glue code, let's say we've got this pipeline again. And again, these things could be 10 different systems. You've got Kafka, and you've got some glue code going into Storm, and some glue code with your state processing going into Cassandra. Um, so Kafka, thousands of users, right? Tens of thousands of users at this point. Um, they tested pretty well. I trust Kafka. Kafka's really cool. Uh, Storm tested really well. Thousands of users, maybe tens of thousands of users. I don't know. Numbers probably going down at this point, but many people use that system. Switch it for something else. Same, same thing. Uh, same thing with Cassandra, right? There's a lot of people there. Generally, if you have a stable version of Cassandra, it's going to do what it says it's going to do. But getting to the glue code, well, maybe I've got a community or a vendor supplied connector that takes my Kafka code and connects it to my Storm code. The number of users of this is going to be lower than the users of the individual systems. 
It's still going to be supplied by a vendor maybe. Maybe I've got native integration in Storm to Kafka. But that code is going to be run less than Kafka by itself or Storm by itself. Right? What's even worse is that the glue code between my Storm processing and Cassandra is written by me. That's it. I have one user, my app that's in production. That code doesn't look like anybody else's code to connect Storm to Cassandra because I wrote it. So maybe you're saying, well, I'm not actually writing glue code. I'm using well-tested Cassandra drivers in my Storm code. So I know Storm is, is I trust Storm. I trust the Cassandra driver. Um, first of all, you're using a computer network to connect these. Probably not running Cassandra and Storm on the same machines. Uh, your computer network is not always reliable. If you say your computer network is always reliable, uh, I'll tell you some mailing lists you can, you can say that in and you'll, you'll get some fun responses. Um, it's, it's, it, generally, these things work until they don't. Uh, Storm might fail in the middle of processing. Right? And that's on you to handle. Right? What, if, what if Storm runs half your job and you send a bunch of things to Cassandra? We're going to come back to that and some of the ramifications. Cassandra might fail in the middle of processing. Right? What, what happens then? How do, what do you do with Storm with your back pressure? How do you back off? Um, and I'm not saying people haven't solved these problems. They have. They're just work. Um, so both systems are tested for all this stuff. But when you put them together with your glue code, there's a lot of things that aren't tested, a lot of modes that you have to test. And the main point here is that the operational glue code is hard. A lot of those things, if they happen in batch, you just start over. It's not a big, you just restart the batch. But in operations, that's not an option usually. So I'm going to move on to this concept of transactional stream processing. And this is something that, uh, you know, for a lot of the apps that people use VoltDB, this is sort of something that, that we pitch. Use the same system for state and for processing. So the code you use to handle an event, to say, if this value is this, do this. If this lookup table says this, then, then go do that. The same thing that you might write in your stream processing system, um, and then use that to write values into your stateful system. Uh, if we put them in the same system, then we can make sure that they're tested together. We can make sure there are no independent failures. We make one transaction, one event. So an event happens, you want to process it and update state in certain ways. Uh, we just make that an ACID transaction. So that ACID transaction is going to be atomic. Either the entire event is processed and the state is updated the way you like, or it's not. There's no failure in between of either mode. Uh, it's consistent, which is sort of like an old-fashioned database word to say we enforce constraints and things, but it's not the most interesting part of ACID anymore. It makes the acronym work, which is nice. Uh, Isolated, right? Two concurrent operations can't interfere with each other. If I'm processing two different events that need to access the same state, it's the system's job to keep them separate from each other and make sure they don't trample on each other. And then durable, right? If it, if it says it's done, then it's done. It's not going to be undone by some rollback from some other job that gets put in. Uh, once I tell the client that this, this particular event has been processed, it's been recorded forever. So. Here's my database state and my processing code. And here's an example sort of, of what happens if things are not atomic. If say I've got a bunch of, of, of operations where the processing code sends a request to state, gets a read. Maybe it sends a write, gets a read. Uh, if things are, are atomic, it can fail in the middle. So you've got two out of four database operations done. The rest are sort of left hanging. My favorite example of why atomicity is good is Romeo and Juliet. So, Juliet has this plan, right? The plan is, I'm going to fake my death, and I'm going to tell Romeo about it. And when, I'm when I wake up in the crypt, Romeo's going to be there, and he's going to say, this was an awesome plan. Now we can be together forever. The problem is Juliet succeeded in faking her death, but she didn't tell Romeo. So because this wasn't an atomic operation, it either happened not at all, not faking your death, not telling Romeo, or entirely faking your death and telling Romeo, Things went very badly for Romeo and Juliet. So isolation is sort of the next one that, that I've got <coughs> slides kind of backing up here. Um, and this is where I've got two different pieces of processing code and they're accessing the same database state. So a uh, good example is the best sermon. There's Ben Franklin. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about an app I built uh, with a customer using VoltDB for managing a call center. And it's interesting in app in a lot of ways. In some of the, it looks like Volt apps in some ways, doesn't look like Volt apps in others, but 
it kind of does a lot of things in terms of the transactional stream processing that are useful. So we start out, we've got millions of customers. They all call on the phone. We've got, say, 3,000 agents. I think they have more at this point. Um, and what happens is that the customers and the agents create actions. Customer calls an agent, customer hangs up. Those are the sort of the ones we're working on. In the real app, there's sort of other things where you get transferred to a different agent. Uh, but between these two uh, parties, there are events. So the events that get generated get pushed into a system that does processing in state. And the goal of the processing in state is to support one, dashboards and alerting. Right, is everything hunky-dory in my call, in data call center? Um, and also, and this is important to support billing. This is really common kind of for a lot of these apps. You want to both support uh, accounting for the, for the financial side and also for the operations side. So the two events that we're gonna focus on are begin call and end call. And begin call is basically a bunch of call metadata that isn't surprising at all and a timestamp. And end call is a bunch of call metadata that wouldn't be surprising at all, and a timestamp. And the kind of problems I have when I'm writing this data center app, I have a correlation problem, right? I need to match the begin and end events. I have an out of order delivery problem. Uh, sometimes I can't guarantee that the end event won't come before the begin event. This isn't because it doesn't happen before the begin event. Typically, someone always makes the call before they hang up. But sometimes the system that's processing that, that's generating the events, that's sending them to my application, uh, gets a little hiccup. And maybe it, it, it actually reverses the order of things if it's a short call. I can't guarantee that things get come in the right order. And for a lot of problems, that happens. Out of order delivery is a really common problem in screen processing. I have at least once delivery, right? So I can guarantee from my source that if I don't get acknowledged, I'll just resend. And so my source can resend until it gets an acknowledgement that the system is going to process it. Um, typically, my choices are at least once delivery or at most once delivery, where I send it and I don't care. Um, and so if I pick at least once delivery, I have to figure out how to de -du uh, duplicate responses. So I might get two begin calls and then an end call for the same call. I need to handle that. Um, that's a really common processing pro uh, problem in stream processing because there's no perfect way to get exactly once delivery of messages. I need to generate a new event on call completion once. So when the call is over, when I've matched the begin and the end calls, I want to create a new event that is basically a record of the call for accounting purposes, for dashboard purposes, uh, to move into a big data system for deeper analysis. I want to do precise accounting. I want to be actually tell you, well, how long has this particular customer been on the phone uh, over the last month so we can build it? I want precise stats, and that supports the accounting, uh, but it also supports the dashboard. So this example is one of the examples we ship in our kit. So if you go, if you download VoltDB, the uh, an Enterprise Edition trial from our white website, or if you just go to GitHub um, and look at the Community Edition of VoltDB, in the examples directory, call center is the app. All this code is there. Uh, everything I say that we're doing, you can just read how to do. You can see how much code it takes to do it. So. Um, I built this app, and one of the things that is interesting about it, uh, it's just a little side note, what's the hardest part of building this application? Um, the hardest part is not the, the what is, how do you handle the begin call event, how do you handle the end call event. That's actually, um, because it's a simplified app and because I've got transactional screen processing, it's very easy to do. The hard part is making data that looks like real world data. Because in practice, things like I said, you get more than one event sometimes uh, for the same event, you get uh, like at least once delivery. You also get um, out of order delivery. So how can we simulate that kind of thing? Uh, first of all, I created a fake call generator, and then I sent it, created sort of a bad network transformer that, that simulates uh, a terrible network. So some things get delayed more than others, some things get flipped, some things get duplicated, um, and that generates a stream of events that is actually interesting to process. Uh, we, when, we, when we test VoltDB, we actually have ways that we can tune the operating system. Uh, there's a number of things you can do in Linux to simulate bad network behavior. Um, there are new tools you can use to simulate bad file system behavior. There are a lot of things we can do, but if you're running an example from VoltDB on, on your laptop or something, uh, we don't want to be messing with your kernel. Uh, so we just have the stream generate data in sort of a fake pattern. 
All right, so, so going through some of these one by one. Correlation. Uh, correlation requires state. Somehow, if I need to say I want to match the begin call to the end call, or occasionally the end call to the end call, um, or if I need to know have I seen this before, I need to have some state. Um, and I don't know how well you can read this because it's in red. And I'm sorry, I think it's better on these TVs quite a bit. Okay. Um, I basically made two tables. Uh, these are just relational SQL tables. I made an open calls table um, that has things like the call ID, the age ID, the metadata I was talking about, and it has a start and end timestamp. Uh, the start and end timestamp defaults to null. And then I had a completed calls table that also has a start and end timestamp with the same call ID, and that defaults to null. Uh, although I don't think it ever will be. Uh, so any unpaired event will create an open calls entry. And as soon as I've got a paired event, it moves into the completed calls. So filtering duplicates uh, requires an item focus. So if I, want, if I get the message more than one time, I need to be able to know that I've processed it before. Item potence, um, maybe this is boring for people who, who deal with this a lot, but item potence is really cool when you're building these systems. It's the property of certain operations in math and computer science, so you can do something multiple times without changing the result beyond the initial application. I got some examples because that's sort of the, the definition, but uh, if I say set x equals to 5, that's item potent. Because if I do it twice, set x equals 5, set x equals 5, there's no difference. But if I say x plus plus, that's not item potent because if I do it twice, I get a different result. Here's a more complicated example. If I say if x is even incremented, I can do that 10 times and it actually just generates the same result. So that's item potent as long as I don't have other threads doing the same thing. Um, but if I say if x is even, double it, that's not item potent. That's going to uh, double it every time. If I spill coffee on dark brown pants, doesn't matter how many times I do that, same result. But if I eat a whole plate of spaghetti, not item potent. After the first one, it seems to be a bad idea. Uh, so in stream processing, whether the system does it for you, whether you're doing it manually, uh, the way to get exactly once semantics, uh, because you can't have exactly once delivery, is by mixing at least once delivery with item potent operations. Then everything seems, you're, you're processing things exactly once, even if you're not actually just receiving them exactly once. So how do we make begin call item potent? Well, this is the pseudo code for handling the begin call event. Um, and if you want to see the actual code, it's all in that github slash bold db uh, slash bold db. So if the call record is in the completed calls, ignore it. Right? If I've already seen a begin and end, I've already matched it, and this is just a way late duplicate, ignore it. If the call record is in open calls, and it's missing the end time, right? So this is the second begin, but I still don't have an end, ignore it. Just do nothing. If the call record is in open calls, but it's an end, the end is in open calls. So this is, if this is a reverse, right? I've got the end, but I never got the begin. Then yeah, complete the call, create an event into completed calls. This handles the swap case. Uh, otherwise, create a new record in the open calls table. So if this is the first message I've seen for this call, create a new record. The end call is basically the reverse of this. It has to do all the same steps. So these two ignores are where we get the item potency. So basically, if I've seen this message before, it's either going to fall into this bucket or it's going to fall into this bucket. And by adding the ability to say ignore, no matter how many times I process this, I'm only going to do the work once. And in, in, in Bolt DB, that whole thing is a transaction. So it's going to do all four of these steps. It's not going to do two of them and stop. Uh, it's either going to do zero of the steps or all four. So that's great for, for correlation. It's great for uh, processing things exactly once. But if I'm doing accounting and statistics, I may have to do actual math. And this is where things get a lot more complicated sometimes. Uh, one of the ways they get more complicated is counting. Counting is really hard at scale. Uh, and that's, that's weird. And if you Google for like counting is hard, you'll come up with a bunch of articles which seem counterintuitive until you read them and think, okay, these people have thought about this quite a bit. Here's one by Leif Walsh when he was working at Toku Tech. It's from a few years ago. Um, that's a decent one, why counting is hard in computers. But there's basically two kinds of fail. There's I missed a count, 
or I have extra counts. And um, here's sort of an example of one way that I might get, uh, I might miss a count. Right? Say I don't have isolation between two different threads. I've got one person who's trying to increment x and a second person trying to increment x. Uh, the first one reads x and says, oh, it's 27. The second one reads x and says, oh, it's 27. And this guy says, well, I'm going to increment it. Now it's 28. And this one who thinks it's 27 says, I'm going to increment it. Now it's 28 again. So because they're overlapping operations, they're not isolated from each other, uh, I can end up, both of them thinking they incremented it, but I lost an update. That's sort of back to this, this not isolated situation. So is my counting right? right? So option A, uh, I just keep the value, right? say 7. Right? I keep a, a 4 byte value in my, in my code, or maybe it's an 8 byte value. And option B is I keep a record of every increment in my database with some unique identifier to dedo. Those are sort of the two standard ways I can do this. Uh, this option requires a few bytes and is pretty much instant. It's O of 1 to get the answer. Right? If I want to know uh, what the count is, it's instant. This thing, I have to basically scan every time someone's incremented something uh, to get it. It requires O n space and O n time, and it probably has higher constants because I'm dealing with UUIDs or something. Uh, so really what I want is option A, but the problem with option A is how do I know it's right? If I say to you, what's the count, and you say 7, and I say, how did you get that? And you say, ah, I don't know. It just says 7. Right? So what we need to do is either option B or build a system where we can trust option A. Or option C is don't care. Uh, and that's, that's a valid option in some apps. But say you want to count with option A. How, what kind of system do you need to do that? So you have systems that have single key consistency. Right? There are sort of NoSQL apps where you can tune the consistency. You can say, I want, I want reasonable consistency on single key. It's, a lot of times it's a little bit harder to achieve than it, than it seems, but, but many, there are systems that can do that. There are other systems that have special features to enable counters. Like Cassandra, for example, has a whole API just for counters, just because counting is hard. Uh, you can use an acid transactional system, right? You can jack up the isolation level in Postgres, just use Postgres. You can use Vault. These systems are always going to give you the right count, hopefully. Uh, and you can use systems that enforce a single writer. So you don't have isolation problems uh, if, if you've got single writer systems. Now, there's still some questions about uh, atomicity and things with single writer, but single writer systems can work too. Um, and one note about acid transactionals, I specifically mentioned you can jack up the isolation level. If you have systems that are running at read committed level, you can have all the same isolation problems and you can get counts wrong. And read committed is a really common default isolation level. Uh, and there are even systems out there where that's the max isolation level. Uh, and as we say in New England, between these and between different systems in these buckets, performance is really variable. Wicked variable, in fact. Uh, so, all right, so that's counting. Moving on to accounting, right? Accounting is just counting, but usually more so. Um, things that you might want to do in accounting that we don't really do so much in just incrementing values, I might want to increment by an amount or decrement, right? Add a balance to somebody's bank balance, right? Um, this thing happened seven times, noted. And then the really, one, one, another thing that makes it harder is I might need to increment or decrement things in groups. So I might need to, you know, the canonical credit debit example, remove something from one balance and add it to the other, right? That's harder than just counting. And um, so here's an example. Uh, say I've got an online game, and a gamer buys a mystical sword of hegemony. Uh, a lot of times you might think, okay, well, I'm just going to debit the rupees or whatever from one get from the account and add a sword to their balance. That does happen. Um, but one of the interesting things when you work with these gaming companies is they update things like real world region stats. Like how many sword, mystical swords of hegemony are there in this part of the world at the same time? Right? Because maybe they don't want to give out too many of them so everyone's running around with them. Um, maybe they want to see how much money is spent in a region. They want to keep all kinds of statistics about how they're selling things. Uh, they're going to update this, uh, let's see. They're going to um, increment offer-related stats, record whether uh, someone bought the missile sort of hegemony as part of an engagement plan, right? They have these algorithms that they run 
that try to trick you into playing for more hours. And so maybe they were running an algorithm that said, show him the mystical sword of hegemony for seven rupees. Uh, and if you bought it, that algorithm needs credit. So someone could say, this algorithm is working. This person is spending money because we figured out the secret sauce to keep them clicking over and over. Uh, and these things get really, really complicated, a lot of A-B testing, and there's, for, for a very simple thing like buying a sword, there can be many, many different variables that are updated. And so this sort of comes into atomicity. Uh, if I need to update a whole bunch of things, I need to make sure they're all updated. Certainly for credit debit, but for all those other statistics too. I want them all to be updated when you buy a sword, or I don't want the sword to be transferred. And how does that affect the sort of graph here? Uh, single key consistency is probably not good enough anymore. It certainly depends on how you architect things, if you shove everything into one key that you need. But if you're dealing with things like whole region stats, it probably isn't going to work with one key. Um, systems with special features to enable counters typically don't work with doing uh, multiple counters incrementing at the same time atomically. You can still use asset transactional systems with the same caveat about the isolation level. Uh, systems that enforce a single writer, sometimes those get more complicated. You get into atomicity issues, but, but you can do it. Um, and again, performance all over the map, even within those bubbles. So uh, another example of something that's related to this uh, is what we call uh, the last dollar program pr problem. We call this at VoltDB. I don't know if it's called this outside of VoltDB, but it's something when we talk to people, they go, yeah, yeah, we have that. Uh, so we've got an ad tech app. And it wants to show a user an ad from a campaign. So let's say the price of the ad is 90 cents. And this particular campaign has a dollar of budget left. Right? The problem here is that uh, if the budget check and the display aren't acid, you might show the ad twice. Right? You might have two different people. And they all decide, well, I'm gonna, that, that campaign has a dollar in it. I'm going to show this person that ad. And someone else may say, well, that campaign has a dollar in it. I'm going to show this person that ad. And you spend a dollar eighty of your one dollar budget. Uh, so, a lot of times the ad tech uh, app, and this is usually the ad tech company, is forced to choose between over or under billing. They either show more ads than the than the campaign paid for, uh, or they leave that dollar in the account because they can't be sure they're not going to double spend it. Right. And so this is either leaving money on the table one way or leaving money on the table the other. If you can get more consistency. You can be more accurate with your billing. You don't have to leave that money on the table. Moving on from accounting, aggregation. Aggregation is basically just counting and accounting that the system does for you. Um, it's the same idea. You're, you're saying, well, I want to roll up my counts by hour. Um, so it's just counting things that are in certain time slots. But, the way this, but usually, most systems, if you're doing aggregation, you can say some declarative way, roll this up by hour. And it will do all this for you. Um, so maybe you want sword sales by region, percent success rates by offer. Um, in the call center, one of the things you might want is average call length by agent. Uh, and so aggregation has exactly the same properties as accounting. If you can do accounting, you can do aggregation. Um, they're, not, they're not different. So a lot of systems don't have the same strong consistency guarantees that systems like Volt does or Postgres or, or some of these systems. And how do you do this without consistency? A lot of standalone stream processors have aggregation frameworks. Um, and one, one of the things that these are really good at is aggregation by time. Uh, and specifically, their aggregation by processing time, by arrival time, rather than aggregation by event time. So if I basically sit around for five seconds, collect every event that comes in, and then sum them up and say, well, this five second window, here's the average. And then I take another five second window, here's the average. Some systems are getting a lot better at this. Um, systems like Flink and some of the, the, the Google stream processing stuff are using watermarks. Uh, there's a lot of cool stuff you can do to get more consistent stream processing. You can get better aggregations. Um, but a lot of these are st still, even if you can get to event time processing, which some of the systems do now, um, these kind of systems are better at aggregating by, uh, by event time. Once you start aggregating by other dimensions, a lot of times it's harder to make horizontally scalable and consistent at the same time. So the other thing you can do is you can just collect all the data and then run a query on it every time you want the aggregation. That's hard to do operationally if you have a lot of data. Um, and so finally, moving past counting, uh, accounting, aggregation, 
actual map. Uh, and this is a little bit of a, a stilted example, but it's, it's very realistic in the sense that things like this do happen. Um, and we, we have a bunch of customers who are doing things like this. So let's say I want to find the mean um, of call link chopped up various ways, but maybe I want the standard deviation too. And if you don't remember statistics from college or whatever you took it, like standard deviation has a formula that um, you kind of you go to the Wikipedia page, you copy this formula, and you look at it, and you say, okay, how am I supposed to do that with screaming? I've got a, a sum, I um, mean, a difference from a mean, and the difference from the mean is the mean is going to be changing every time I get a value. Uh, and so what I did was I looked up uh, sort of standard deviation in a streaming way. And you can actually get the variance, which is the, uh, just I think the, the square root of the standard deviation. I don't know if I'm rusty here. The square. the square of the standard. That's it, not the opposite of that. Um, so you can get a running variance, and there's a bunch of formulas. Um, and you basically can do the math, and you can figure out how to get uh, a running variance uh, on, on this algorithm. So you take the values you've got, and I can update it. Every time I get a value, I can update a value for the running variance for that group. Uh, this doesn't really matter much, right? The details for what the math is, right? Like what is these actual formulas? If you go to the code that, that is in our examples folder, it's all there. This is real code, it's not hand wavy there, it's specifics. Um, but the details don't matter because I've got, I'm doing it in a transaction. So whatever math I do in the transaction either happens completely or doesn't happen at all. And that, that makes things a lot easier is because as I do more and more complicated things, uh, systems that don't offer that, that transactional guarantee get a lot harder to implement more and more complicated things. And that's a, kind of a typical pattern we see a lot where you've got an app and it's built on a system that is a little bit less consistent and then someone says, well, I'd like this statistic. And you say, that one is the one too far. And so that's something where we try to make it so that that is not the problem with systems like Bolt. Uh, there are caveats, of course, it's data processing. If our jobs weren't hard, we wouldn't be paid as well. Um, we still need to think about performance, so I had to find a running variance that, that operated a reasonable time. If the running variance had to scan every tuple or something, I had to actually ca uh, calculate that. Um, if I actually was updating the mean of all these values and doing it with the other equation, that would have been painful. Um, I need to think about horizontal partitioning of work. So a lot of apps partition really well. Um, but this is something that Volt asks you to do, is think about how can I partition my workload to multiple clusters so I can do these streams in parallel. Some apps don't partition as well as others. A lot do, um, but that's something that you have to think about in this kind of context. If I'm running one node, I don't have to think about it as much, but then I don't have as, as much uh, flexibility in terms of my operations. So that, that basically the point here is that if I integrate the state and processing, so if I make the state and processing one transaction, I can write this map without thinking about failure. Right? I don't have to worry about what if it fails in the middle. I don't have to worry about what if two um, events are doing the same map on the same state at the same time. Um, and I don't have to worry about am I seeing all the data. Right? I'm definitely seeing all the data that's arrived at that point. Um, so, so partial visibility, visibility to state is less of an issue. Uh, all right, a couple of bonus topics here. Latency is important. This is one of the things that drives operations, right? What makes operations different than other kinds of systems is that there's often a latency SLA. I need to get an answer in a certain amount of time. One of the things that we, we really like to do um, in our apps is, is be able to get an answer reliably enough and, and fast enough that we can affect a decision. So in this example, maybe a customer swipes a credit card and the bank wants to know, is this a fraudulent swipe or not? So I've got 500 milliseconds or so before I need to say yes or no on that particular, uh, that particular credit card swipe. Um, and the more accurate fraud reporting I can do in that 500 milliseconds, the more I can get an answer back saying, no, no, don't let this through, um, then the more money I can save the bank. Certainly, um, here I can do really, really cool fraud detection using um, all kinds of machine learning and, and, and uh, on the big data. So if I collect all the day's transactions and I scan through it, I can say, hmm, that one looks fraudulent. But at that point, I've already charged the car. The person has walked off with the talking fish or whatever it is that they bought, um, and I've lost money. 
right? I may not fall for it twice, but I've lost money. So the more I can do here, the better. So we like to, to um, target applications where the latency has a chance to affect the decision. So in finance, a lot of times that's, that's fraud or risk management. Uh, in ad tech, a lot of times that's you know, the decision to show which ad um, or, or take some uh, action while the page is being displayed. We do a lot of stuff that's related to ad tech. We do like micro personalization apps where it's not so much uh, what ad do I show you, but um, how do I keep you engaged? So airlines use us to basically, for their frequent flyer customers, like what, what are the things that we want to put on your page to make you loyal to our airline? Um, all kinds of really interesting stuff. Uh, games is very similar. What kind of, uh, how can I kind of say, how, how can I get you to click on this thing for another seven hours uh, is a really common problem in the gaming industry. And um, we're technically proud, but morally ashamed to help with that. So getting into the fast path, this is sort of what I was just saying. Uh, policy enforcement in telco is a big thing we do. Should I let this call through? Does the user have balance for this car call? Is it fraudulent? Um, a, a sizable percentage of the world's mobile phone calls are now authorized through a Volt DB application. Um, so that like time between when I dial a phone number and you start hearing the ringing, it's going to a system that's, you, that, that, I don't know what percentage of the time, but double digit percent of the time is going through Volt DB. Um, and it's basically running a stored procedure that says, should I let your call through? And it's recording that call. And if that procedure doesn't respond in 50 milliseconds, you don't get billed for your call. Uh, so the way we're measured by those customers is how many times do we not respond in 50 milliseconds? Uh, if every time we don't respond in 50 milliseconds, they lose money. So uh, the other thing we do is, like I said, change what a user sees in response to an action. Uh, change the next website based on recent actions, that kind of thing. Uh, so latency is a really exciting thing for Volt. A lot of the apps we have are really, really sensitive to latency. They can do more the faster and more reliable the response is. Uh, the other question that is really important to all this, and I sort of hinted at it before, is does your data matter? Um, and of course your data matters, but how much, right? And so here, here's one of my example problems. Say I've got a factory full of robots. Uh, sometimes they break. They log metadata, and there's a, a bunch of people who go around fixing it. So before I added my, my processing system to process all this metadata, uh, maintenance people, they work on stuff based on their experience, based on maintenance schedules, they, I haven't tuned up this machine in a while, uh, based on visual inspection. They got pretty far, but can we do better? And so they built a system that was up 99% of the time, and it provides a much richer guidance to maintenance Robots fail a lot less often, cost less to operate. It's a huge win for the business. Um, now, maybe a more sophisticated system comes along, and it's up 99.99% of the time. Uh, offers even more insight. At this point, though, the robots may fail not much less at all, right? The difference between 99 and 99.99 .99 in this case may not be hugely impactful to the business. Whereas for those ad tech companies, for those gaming companies, for the telco companies, they might. And sort of my formula for how to decide uh, when it's important to uh, invest in this kind of consistency. So I have to figure out what is the cost of the system. And the cost of the system includes licensing, it includes the hardware to run the system or the cloud, um, it includes engineering work, how much time, salary am I paying people, um, and it includes you know, what's the cost of switching from whatever I'm using now. And so these can be significant. Uh, and licensing is often the one that you go, whoa, um, but, but that's often trivial compared to the other ones. So, uh, let me go back. So, if I look at the cost of the system here, and I look at uh, what are the number of operations I'm doing? Is this a system that's doing a tremendous amount of throughput or, or not, not as much? What's the probability of failure under what I'm using and what I'm evaluating? Is the system that I'm evaluating a lot less likely to fail? or a lot more likely to fail? And what is the expected average failure cost? Right? When the system breaks, what does it cost me? Do I write a big check because I, I lost some money, because you know, somebody was able to purchase something with a credit card they weren't supposed to? Um, was my website down and I lost sales? What's the cost of failure? So ad tech use cases, right? Um, really high number of operations. The individual operations aren't particularly valuable. But the, the volume is so high that making um, difference at the margins can actually make a tremendous amount of money difference. 
Um, if you have really complex multi-cluster systems with a lot of monsters, you have people who say, oh, I'm running 120 sharded MySQL servers, and I've got this whole schema repository, and I've started using them as a key value store, and basically I've got 100 people managing these clusters, and it's working for me. Um, but the, the systems with a high percentage of failure, by bringing the failure rate down at the margins, can save you a lot of money. Um, and also billing systems and fraud systems where the cost per failure is high. Right? If you lose a lot of money every time you screw up, then screwing up less matters. So I'm sort of, sort of summing up here, but um, more consistent systems don't have to be more expensive. This is sometimes counterintuitive um, because a lot of times these things are really, uh, there's sometimes more moving pieces. They're not as simple as some of the NoSQL systems out there. They're not, they're not necessarily um, you know, do one thing and do it well, sort of that Unix philosophy which I really admire, um, but when you're dealing with do one thing and do it well, and it's on you to glue all those things together to build, to cobble together a system, um, more integrated systems can sometimes save you a lot of money in unexpected ways. Uh, easier to develop means less engineering, that's probably your biggest cost, and more efficient means less hardware, which depending on who you are, maybe your second cost. Um, that's sort of the end of my talk, um, and the, the conclusion is sort of that if you're doing operations, integration is, is a lot of value. Um, and if you're doing analytics, batch, or some of the other things, then specialized tools are probably more appropriate. Uh, when you have transactional transactions, especially when you have strong isolation levels, uh, then a lot of the complex math really just becomes typing in the complex math into whatever programming language you're using. Uh, and many of these problems can be solved without transactional streaming. Uh, like I said, you go to these conferences and you listen to pe the way people solve these problems. Um, and I don't want to make it seem like Volt is, is you know, there are no trade-offs that we make. Everything in engineering is trade-offs. Uh, there are going to be things that are harder in Volt than in other systems. Um, but, but a lot of these consistency problems are some of the most challenging problems you have in engineering. If you have a problem where your data is valuable and you can save money by, by changing the, the rate of failure, changing the rate of losing data, um, it's going to be uh, a, a beneficial to go with one of these transactional systems. Uh, so that's it. Thank you guys so much for having me. Uh, I appreciate it. I'm happy to answer whatever questions you want. And if you want to reach out to me, if you're interested in learning more about Bolt TV, I can send you all kinds of information. I answer my own email. Um, and if you have questions like I don't I don't agree with you I think you're wrong uh, who are you again I'll answer those questions too I, I'm sure I'm wrong about something thank you that's John Hub thank you very much.